Father, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your grace, and your compassion. Above all, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his precious and redeeming blood, for your holy written word, and for the mighty Holy Spirit who leads and guides us into the truth and brings to our remembrance the things that Jesus said. It is with great joy, unspeakable and full of glory, that we deposit this service into your charge for safekeeping. We thank you in advance for anointing every ear, every mind, every heart, and every soul to receive the engrafted word. We welcome and invite the supernatural of God to be in the manifestation in this service, even as the Spirit wills. Now, Lord, I just thank you that as you anoint this vessel of clay to minister life to your people boldly without fear, favor, or respect of persons, that your word may proceed as it does from your own mouth. It will not return to you void, but it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereunto it is sent. We bind the hand of Satan in the name of Jesus. He will in no wise hinder, impede, or interfere with the word. And as revelation knowledge flows as a mighty river from heaven's throne, we give you, Lord God, all the praise, the honor, and the glory. We believe we receive these petitions that we have desired of you, for we ask them in Jesus' mighty name. Let everybody say glory to God. Let everybody say hallelujah. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, get radical out there. Turn around and slap a high five with three or four people. Tell them something good is going to happen to you today. Glory. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. God bless all of y'all. Praise the Lord. Yeah. How, listen, I'm, I'm glad I didn't have to get on a plane for two hours, get my passport out to make it to the Caribbean today. Huh? We had the Caribbean up here with the Music Worship and Arts Department. Give them a great big hand. How about that? Yeah. Look like they dressed to go. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, I'll tell you what, that's a wonderful thing. God, I believe, is absolutely the architect of music. Amen. And uh, we, we appreciate that genre of music as we uh, enjoy their Caribbean presentation here today. Uh, you know, God is worshipped all over the world. Amen. And it's interesting because when you go into different countries and you experience or witness different cultures, it is remarkable. I, I remember when we went to Africa and uh, it, it's, it, it, the experience is just so different. The customs of welcome and appreciation for people like us who visit there. Uh, because, you know, it's kind of like, in a sense of speaking, as African Americans kind of returning home a little bit. Uh, we, we left on the boat, but we flew back in. Anyway, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that right there. Pray, praise God. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Listen, we've been dealing with the uh, series or topic of families and relationships or family relationships, very, very important. When you look at what's going on in the culture, and I mean, it seems like there's something coming up every week. Now, you know, we, we're witnessing these events that are going on in our college campuses all over the United States. Now, not every school is necessarily caught up in this uh, challenge. Is anybody out there know what pastor's talking about? Wave your hand if you've seen this. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you have. It, it's, you know, it's consuming the news cycle, all right? Uh, you've got a lot of kids out there in these top-notch colleges, what they call Ivy League, which are supposedly our top universities and colleges and things like that. And they're pr protesting, and, you know, they're saying they're protesting against the war that's going on in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas. And, uh, you know, they've, they've got some very interesting things that are going on there. But there's a lot to that because you gotta, you got to wonder, how did they come to that place? Amen. You know, it, let me put it this way. It's not about choosing sides. L let me explain something to you. The scripture says in Psalm, it says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's very, very specific. Amen. Now, now hold on a minute. 
because it also says, 2 Timothy chapter 1, it says pray for all men. Amen. So it doesn't leave anybody out. Yeah. Amen. If we have to pray for all men, and that's not just the male of the species. Amen. That's men and women, boys and girls. That's everybody, all right? Remember, I told you, you have to rightly divide. You have to look at the context in Scripture whenever, you know, it, it seems to get gender specific. Now, God's not in this other gender stuff we're wrestling with out here, but I'm, but I'm just saying a lot of times he may be referring to all of humanity or some of it or a collective and a locality, or indeed he may be speaking specifically. But if you look at the context in which you see man or men appear, then you can understand what God is saying and to whom he's saying it. Amen. And that's very important that you can rightly divide that. And of course, if you allow him, the Holy Spirit will always lead you and guide you into the truth because that's what Jesus said that he would do. Amen. So you won't be confused about, well, gee, I wonder, is he talking about this one or that one or the other? So yeah, we're, we're obligated to pray for all men. In fact, all men are obligated to pray. Amen. Luke said, when Jesus taught the parable of the unjust judge, after he heard it, he said, Jesus spoke a parable to them unto this end. So you see, in Luke 18, 1, where he says it, hold your place in Ephesians uh, 5 minutes. Go back over here to Luke's gospel. You know, a lot of times this happens with pastor. I get started in something, then the next thing, Lord says, look at this here a minute. So look at 18, uh, Luke's gospel, chapter 18, verse 1. This is Luke, the physician a disciple of Jesus. He spake a parable to them to this end. In other words, here's the purpose why he spoke or taught this parable, because Jesus was always teaching in parables. He, well, I should say he oftentimes taught in parabolic ways, okay? He said that men, here's the, here's the end, here's the point. The reason he taught this, he said men ought always to pray and not to faint. In other words, don't give up, don't lose hope, you know, when it says, ask, seek, and not, the tense in that passage, that's Matthew 7, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. It carries the context that ask and keep on asking. Amen. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Hallelujah. Now, let's rightly divide that for a minute because God isn't deaf. Oh, that's right. So when you ask... It's not that you have to ask him five times for the same thing. Ask, seek, and knock is speaking more and to an approach toward God about whatever as it pertains to you. So you may ask God about something that is relative to your home today, and maybe there's another issue you need to address in the same day, as a matter of fact, maybe an hour after you did that. That's right. And you say, gee, I didn't ask God about this business deal or what. Okay, so you can ask him. Amen. Approaching him through asking and seeking and knocking. Amen. The idea is it's a continuum. Amen. Amen. You know, I know, you know, somebody said, well, if you ask, if you ask more than once for the same thing, the second time you ask was an unbelief, right? Because, of course, why? You, you, you can't argue with that because Jesus said, ask, and what did he say? You shall what? Okay, that settles that then. Amen. All right, he said, what, what, what's the next one? Seek and what? You shall find. That settles that. Jesus said that. And knock, and what happens? The door shall be open unto you. So, in other words, Jesus said, here are the methodologies or modalities by which you may certainly approach God. And, of course, you come to God in the name of Jesus. You're a part of the family. Everybody say, I'm a part of the family. Of God. Yeah, let's get that straight. I, I'm not talking about Smith, Jones, Brown, Blue, whatever you are right now, okay? I, I'm talking about being a part of the family of God. And that's very, very important. Never forget that. You're a part of the family of God. Uh, the devil would love to vacate your mind and vacate your soul and separate you from God to the point where you think, oh, he's not with me anymore. But you got an eternal promise from God. He told you he will never leave you nor forsake you even to the end of the world. Amen. So I just wanted to get that straight before you. Ask, seek, 
and not. That's, that's what it's talking about because it's, if you get everything by asking, then what's the seeking about? And if you get everything by seeking God, well, what's, this, what's the knocking business? And of course, it's three different dynamics, three different dimensions of approaching God, uh, whether you are making a petition or you're seeking supplication or whatever you're wanting God to intervene or get involved in something or another with you. So, you know, that, that's the whole thing. So the first time you asked him, oh, Lord, I, yeah, I should tell him that. I don't know if you all read the story or maybe remember me teaching about it at some point. When Daniel, Daniel sought God. And uh, the angel of the Lord came to him. And it took him 21 days to arrive. When he arrived, he explained to Daniel that, you know what? The first time you called on us, we got the call. It didn't go to call waiting. It wasn't forwarded. There wasn't a busy signal. We heard you right on the top. But there was another revelation too the angel brought. He said, you know, there's some tumult and turmoil in the heavenlies. And he said, essentially, you know, I had to battle my way through here to get to you in order to bring this. And really, it reveals also, oh man, I, never, I hadn't really seen it this way. It revealed also the strong spirits that were involved in that Babylonian empire. Amen. Yeah. You know, these, these incredible empires in the history, like the Egyptians and the Babylonians, the Greeks and whatnot, they were definitely interacting and interchanging with spirits. Amen. Frankly, much of it in the occult area. Amen. Amen. And so no doubt there was some warfare and those kinds of spirits want to set up what, you know, they, you know, Israel defends itself with what they call, uh, is it an iron dome? So when missiles come in, the iron dome is sort of an intercepting thing. And they shoot the missiles, they track them, boom, you know, they knock them out before they can come and do damage. Well, in a sense of speaking, that's what the enemy tries to do. You know, the Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. The rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. Principalities, it starts from the highest rank and goes down to the bottom. Principalities and powers, in other words, principal spirits, and all of them are not good. Some of them are bad news. And they establish a territory, and they hold over a place. That's the reason why, if you don't believe it, some cities, some whole cities are essentially influenced by an unclean spirit. Amen. Even nations. Amen. Some nations that are just stuck, if I may, in poverty or in confusion or in divisiveness or whatever. And that's not normal. That's not the image of God. God said he created us in his image and after his likeness. So those things are really real. And, you know, even looking at the condition of the world today, it is quite evident to see those kinds of spirits at work in the world today. And yes, I think I was talking about this a little bit last week, yes, they can infiltrate. I don't care how brilliant the politicians are, I do not care what their resume reads, I don't care what their acumen or their skills or their level of education. Those are things that we can acquire, I should say, on an earthly level. But we're all spirits that have souls. And the enemy is really trying to target specifically the human soul. Amen. Now, he wants the human spirit, but he, he definitely targets the human soul. Why? Because that's what pretty well controls all of your day-to-day. -day. Your mind, where you're thinking and reasoning. Your emotions, where you're expressing and feeling. And your, your will, where you're choosing and deciding. And the devil definitely attacks in those areas in order to gain expression in this world. Amen. 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 And so, you know, there's nothing shocking going on out there. Not, not to me. I don't know about you. 
There's nothing shocking. Not, not when you know what the Word of God says and what it teaches you. So it, it, you have to understand that stuff trickles down. Sure. It starts, you know, the devil wants to get an individual. But then if he's trying to attack you and your family, it's not, he doesn't just want you. He wants the whole house. Amen. Then he wants to take the hood, you know, the neighborhood, all right, the community. Let me put it that way, all right? Amen. <laughs> Amen. I don't want to get, you know, locality specific, but you understand what I'm saying. Take the neighborhood, take the community, take the city, mess up the state. And, I mean, you can go to certain areas here, even our own nation. Certainly there's areas in other nations of the world they all seem to have a similar distribution of issues. And they all seem to be strong in one area or another. And it's not until someone breaks through. Amen. You know, we just had the National Day of Prayer here recently. I know it, it, it was, I'm sure it was, I know it was very fervent because, you know, we were participating in it. I posted something on our social media. I said, look, everybody needs to engage in this. Amen. That didn't mean you're going to be praying for 24 hours, but I just was saying, hey, uh, like Jesus said, could you not tarry one hour? Amen. Could you not intercede? Could you not supplicate? Could you not petition God for an hour uh, for the sake of the nation? It is a national day of prayer. That's what it was for. So it's a, it was set aside to pray for the nation. This has been going on, whether you know it or not, about seven decades as far as I know, okay? It's been going on for 70 plus years or whatever, and so uh, that's a good thing that uh, somebody had the idea to set aside a special day for praying for our nation. And it's not only our nation needs prayer, uh, prayer all nations need prayer. And that's why God said through Paul, who wrote the letter to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, he said, look, there I go. There I go. I, 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 will, I promise I'll get back to Ephesians. Go to 2 Timothy for a second. 2 Timothy. Chapter 1. You know, it's amazing. These short letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, man, are really, really powerful. Did I say something there? All right. What was up? Did I say 2 Timothy? Wait a minute. Oh, I'm thinking something else, everybody. Bear with, bear with Pastor. 1 Timothy. Pardon me. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, Obviously, these are different kinds of prayer. And giving of thanks for different modalities of prayer. Supplications. Something needs to be supplied here. Amen. Amen. Prayers. Well, that's all manner of prayer. Intercessions. You're praying for others. And giving of thanks be made for all men. There you go. Underline it. All men. It's in the, it's in the original Greek text. All men. For kings and for all that are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, Amen. our Savior. Whoa. We do this for what? So that we can live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, as you look out there in the natural, it seems that all the opposite of these desired outcomes are presenting themselves, manifesting themselves in our culture and in our society. Now, you know, the first thing you'd want to think on this, well, wait a minute, people are not praying. Well, listen, it doesn't take everybody in the country to pray. It takes God's people in the country. Second Chronicles 714 says, now if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. You know, I find that interesting. The first thing he says they need to do is humble themselves. Why? Because for some reason or another, we have to battle through a prideful spirit. Humble themselves and pray. 
and seek my face Ooh. and turn from their wicked ways. Man, it sounds like ask, seek, and not to me. Amen. God said, then I will hear from heaven, yes. forgive the sin, and then heal the land. Amen. My God, what, what a step and stage situation. God's people call by his name, humble themselves, and pray, and listen, and seek God's face, and turn from their wicked ways. Yeah. God said, I will hear from heaven, yeah. I will forgive the sin, yeah. and heal the land. Yeah. When you combine these passages that we've looked at here thus far in these last few minutes, from Luke 18, 1, from 1 Timothy 2, and uh, when, you, when you look at all this and you knit all of this together, you see God means business about prayer. Amen. And, and see, when Luke said, he said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Don't give up because things don't seem to be changing. You keep doing what you should be doing. As I said, one thing also we're witnessing, we're still moving down the prophetic timeline. This uh, rook is going on in the campuses of our you know, colleges and things, this is another little push down the prophetic timeline. It reminds me of Hosea chapter four, when God says, seeing you have forgotten me or your God, I will forget your children. And I was telling you, God's not just talking about youngsters and toddlers and whatever, because oftentimes we as humanity are called children. Don't we call ourselves children of God? Which we say, I'm a child of God. Right. The children of Israel. Well, everything coming out of Israel isn't just kids. They start as kids, but they grow up and have grown adults, right? Amen. But God still referred to them as the children of Israel. Amen. So when God says, I forget your children, listen, this can cover a lot of collectives. Not just little infants, not just adolescents, not just young adults. This can cover an entire familial group, whatever. So we don't need to forget God. And this is what the greatest temptation is in the times in which we're living right here and right now. You have to remember, Jesus, well, Paul warned Timothy, he said, you know, in these latter times, some will depart from the faith. Some's already too many. They'll depart from the faith. And he told you why, too, because they're giving heed to seducing spirits. They're listening to spirits engaged in seduction. Seduction is not an instant takeover. Seduction is a process. Something that takes place over time. And it moves in steps in stages. The enemy tries to gain territory. The territory of you. The territory of your family, the territory of your community, the territory of your city and your state and your nation or whatever your province, whatever it is for any of you around the world. This is how he attempts to take ground and take charge. That's why the scripture says that when the enemy comes in, you pause right there, like a flood, the spirit of the Lord raises up a standard against him. I know you feel like the devil's flooding you. No, no, no. When he comes in, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Amen. You have to remember these things. You have to even speak these things. Remind yourself. It's, part, it's something called meditation, meditating on the word, speaking the word, decreeing and declaring. All of that is involved in this. And it certainly is involved when it comes down to our family relationships. Now we can go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Glory. Verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21 says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Amen. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That's the standard by which you should submit one to another. When you submit, you, you're giving up, in a sense of speaking, your right to Command, control, decide, whatever. Now, it doesn't take all of that away from you. You are voluntarily 
setting it aside in deference to your mate. Amen. Submitting yourselves one to another. We saw in a previous segment how God is the architect of the family. We saw the first thing he did is he brought a man, made a man, put him in the earth, put him in the garden. He gave a man a job. Please notice the order of things. And then he made the woman. I mean, Adam was on the job before, before God performed the procedure. Right? So Adam, he, he, his job was to keep the garden. Word keep from the Hebrew means protect it, guard it. Obviously, God was fully aware there was an enemy. And, of course, we find out a little later on, it sure was. He said, well, how did he get there? Well, if you don't recall, Jesus gave this testimony during one of his times in his earthly ministry. He said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. That's pretty fast. In other words, Jesus said, I witnessed a firing of an archangel. I witnessed the firing of an archangel. And notice how quickly the firing took place. And so, and again, we have no, we're not given any sense of time. I, I, you know, it's amazing to me when it says in the beginning, you, we have no concept of whether that's centuries, millennia, what is that? We don't, it doesn't even matter. Just know in the beginning, no one really knows the length of time. I talked to you about Adam and Eve, and then they had, you know, Cain and Abel. And, uh, you know, we don't even know. Uh, how old these guys were. We, look, they were born, so they started off as infants. Amen. See, Eve said, I got a man from the Lord. And they called his name Cain. Amen. And then she got another man from the Lord, she said, and she called him Abel. Amen. All right? But then the scripture says, now watch out, clue, said that Cain and Abel had a conversation. You got to read it closely. Right after the conversation, Bible says Cain rose up and slew his brother Abel. Scripture does not describe any weapon or anything. The outcome was Abel is dead and Cain is a murderer. He committed fratricide. That's what they call it in the legal term. He killed his brother. Doesn't say how. But God knew it. That's for sure. <laughs> Looked like the moment after he did it, God called out, Cain, where is your brother Abel? What was Cain's response? Am I my brother's keeper? God said, your brother's blood cries out to me from the earth. That has opened herself to receive it. So if you wonder where burial came from, there you go. All of it's right there, right from the very beginning. You see, you have to understand something here. Here we have a family in grief. First case of domestic violence. How did it get there? And then Adam and Eve, because Cain, Cain was dismissed, <laughs> okay? God told me, you're going to be a fugitive and a vagabond, man, running here and there and everywhere. And here's Adam and Eve. They got to bury their son. First funeral. First burial. What kind of grief went through there? There's a lot to think about there. And when you get to it, what I really want to be the ultimate outcome in this teaching is, is how important and how precious family is. And how important it is to do your very best to sustain the strength of familial relationships. Parents to children. If there's multiple children, sibling to sibling. And of course, families are very, many are very large, you know, brothers and sisters, and you got uncles and aunts, and many of you, some of you are blessed to have, be still in the presence of four and five generations. That's awesome. Where, where the youngest is looking at not only their parent, but they're looking at their great and their great, great, and even sometimes, and once in a while, their great, great, great ancestor. Very, very important. Very, very important. And it's very important, it's love that's the real glue that keeps it all together. Amen. So it goes on to say, now, and understand, as you read this passage, you have to understand that God has assigned different functions for the man and the woman. And he established the structure of the family right there in the beginning at the Garden of Eden. 
He says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Praise God. Charlie Ray, be quiet. I know it. It's okay. All right. No, I'm not playing. Praise God. Okay. So, for the husband is the head of the wife. See, notice the descriptions here. Wives are submitting, but God says the responsibility of the husband is to take charge and oversee the well-being and the welfare of the family. It doesn't make him better than the wife or the wife better than the husband. It's defining roles. Functions and responsibilities, all right? The husband is the head of the wife, even as, here's the standard, Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. See, man, we got to look at who Christ is, what Christ does. And, and we, we, listen to me, we have to live that out. Are you listening to what I'm saying? We have to live that out. We have to show our families what does that look like. What does Christ look like in a husband? What does Christ look like in a wife? What does Christ look like in a son, in a daughter, in an uncle, an aunt, a grandparent, a cousin? And listen, it goes on beyond that. What does Christ look like in the marketplace? There you are, the CEO or the CIO or the CFO or whatever you are, the supervisor, the manager. What does Christ look like in those roles? Because, see, the best role, the best that's going to come out of that role is the role closest to what Christ would be doing in that role. So, yeah, that's right. On the job, how do you show Christ? Because, look, I know a lot of people on your job, maybe as well as some folks in your family, they're not reading the Bible, they don't care about God, they, you know, they don't even believe. So you got to give them a translation they can read. And that's you. You may be the only translation, I'm just saying, for a season that ultimately draws them on in. Yeah, they might witness you reading your Bible, listening to some, you know, gospel music on the radio or something like that, or studying the Word or whatever. You're going to church and engage in whatever activities and operations are going on in the ministry and things like that. That's fine. But again, you are called among other things, living epistles. Amen. Word epistle means a letter. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called the epistle of Paul to the Colossians or the epistle of Paul to the Galatians. It's a letter, and we're living letters. Amen. So in essence, we, we become a living translation of sorts as a witness to other people about what does it look like to have Christ in our lives. Amen? Amen. All right. Okay, so... The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Now, that sounds cool. Man, I'm the head. I'm in charge. No, that's not what this is. This is responsibility. Everybody say responsibility. responsibility. How do you respond to God's ability in you? That's what this is. Responsibility. You bringing children into the world as a father, and you're a husband, I sure hope you are, uh, that's responsibility. The upbringing of those children is critical in terms of their need to have a mom and a dad. I don't want to go over the statistics now. I may go over some a little later in this series about what happens when kids are brought up in a single-parent household, and most single-parent households are led by mom. And if that's a situation anyone finds themselves in, it's really important. This is why church is so important. It, when you have a church family, when you have a congregational body, and you, are you listening to what I'm saying? Because you can get the influence of men in, into the life of your children. You know, we just recently had a champions meeting, and I did something entirely different. I told the men, I said, look, you know what? I don't want to be the center of attention here today. I said, I want you to be the center of attention today. And so God led me to call up a cross-section. What do I mean by that? Cross-generational. Cross-generational. From our young men, through our middle-aged men, through our elders. To come up, and the assignment was, I want you to tell these men 
what you feel is the most important thing they need to know. And you would have been proud because, I, listen, these youngsters, these young men from age 16 right on through to 80, 80 plus, listen, they're, the way they expressed themselves was awesome. But I'm going to tell you one incredible thing that stood out to me more than anything else they all said. And they all had good things to say. I learned that entrepreneurial spirit is out there. It, it's alive and well Amen. in these youngsters. And, but, but the main thing that really I walked away with was how much influence the men of the church had in their lives. Amen. They testified to the fact that it changed their lives. Amen. That they could have gone awry. They could have gone off course. They could have been derailed. But because elder men, and when I say elder, it don't have to be 80. It could be anybody. It could be 40, 60, anything. Listen, because they gave some attention and some time to them, to talk to them. And see, in mentoring people and engaging with them, you know, it's, it's good to be able to impart some things, but you got to ask some things so you can locate where these people are and then help them, give them, give them some counsel and some wisdom. And that's, that was one of the biggest things that came out of our event there. And, you know, at the end, I mean, everybody seemed to be very, very up. They enjoyed it. We were all blessed Amen. as a result of what happened. And, and I'm, thank you. God bless. Praise the Lord. That's what's important. I know you think you're here. But Pastor, I, I, I got to get my word. I got to get my blessing. I got to get my, my decree and my de declaration. I got to get my prayer from you. Yeah, but what you got to give to everybody else? I want to know what you're bringing to the table. See, at home, you're bringing the beans, the bacon, and the bread. But you got to bring more than that. It takes way more than just some groceries to make a household work. And to bring structure and discipline and order into a family. There's a lot of intangibles that have to be incorporated into the family structure. Amen. Go in every direction. Amen. Amen. Verse 24, therefore as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. You know, it's amazing because what I just said to you about the previous two verses, I want you to understand this. What does Christ look like in you as a member? as a parishioner, yes. as a part of this church family. What, what, what does Christ, how much expression does he have through you toward others? Because this is a church family. Amen. Look, I know you're different families. Uh, look, all of you are sovereign households in your respective right. You know, when you leave here, you're going to a specific house, and that's your house. And you're going to leave with your husband or your wife or your, your daughter or your son or whoever, whatever. But I want to know, how do you interrelate right here? What do you contribute? What did, what did you learn at home growing up? I don't know what you learned. I know what I learned. We had chores. Amen. We had stuff to do. Right. And we didn't have a choice. Amen. Say amen. amen. There's this strange spirit that comes over church folk. I, got, I ain't got to do nothing what pastor says. Pastor call for volunteers, pastor call for people to do this, or call for people to do that. And let me tell you something, I shouldn't be the only one doing any call. Amen. You people in leadership, you should be doing some calling. You should be doing some recruiting. You should be doing some getting to know this one and getting to know that one. All right? You should be treating them at Waffle House or a cup of coffee or whatever. You should be extolling the virtues of service in the kingdom of God. Stop looking for excuses. I'm about to take the lid off this place. I remember, look, I remember Miles Monroe said, talked about the difference between leaders and managers. Look, I got to set aside my management hat for a minute. I got to have my leadership hat on now. He said managers get everything in order and whatnot. He said, but then leaders come along and tear it all up. So I'm fixing to tear y'all up today. You say, how are you going to do that, Pastor? It's very simple. Okay? Amen. Amen. Did you ever stop to think for a minute? Jesus gathered 12 disciples 
12 men. None of them was a preacher. They were all businessmen. One was a tax man, Matthew, all right? There were scholars. Wait a minute. There were commercial fishermen in the group. So they all seemed to have a business acumen. Jesus didn't call any of them an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, an apostle, a prophet, none of that. He saw them at various stages of his earthly ministry. He said, come and follow me. You know that amazing? A man you've never seen before, you don't even know. He says, come, follow me. He told the fishermen, you know what? Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Wow, I've never done that before. What's that all about? And you know what's interesting to me? Seemed like among the 12, one guy particularly had a clue as to who this Jesus really was. And that was Peter. Remember, Jesus asked, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And man, they called out everybody. You know. But Jesus said, well, here's the real deal. Who do you say that I am? And it's always going to come down to that. And Peter spoke up. He was always a speaker up. He had a personality like that. Peter had a dynamic personality. I don't know whether that was due to fishing or what. But Peter was like that. I say you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, Jesus gave revelation that nobody knew at the time. He said, you know what? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Amen. Apparently, up to that time, nobody had a clue. They said, well, here's another itinerant evangelist going about Galilee, teaching and preaching. But Jesus was doing more than teaching and preaching, man. He was healing and doing miracles. But here's the point I want to get to, and this is where I come and blow up everything. Yeah, he calls these guys, as far as I can see, okay, as far as I can see, he had three and a half years with these dudes. Three and a half years. Now, that's not a lot of time. It takes us four years to get a bachelor's degree. Now, some kids can get it in three. You know, so now, nowadays you can take all these advanced placement tests in school and whatnot, and, and some of your children can enter into college in their sophomore year as opposed to freshman. So they, they really eliminated the first year of college. That's great. That's wonderful. If you can do that, praise the Lord. Nothing wrong if it takes you four. But Jesus had to, shall I say, deal with these guys in three years. And then, listen, I want to tell you something. He had CE. Anybody know what that is? CE in relationship to business. It's called continuing education. Jesus provided CE, continuing education, through the ultimate teacher, the Holy Ghost. Praise God. And also the fivefold ministry. Now, here's what I'm saying. He brings these 12 guys in, makes them his staff, and I didn't see any pre-qualification. Now, these guys were raw and rough. Now, now, amen, amen. They were raw and rough. Now, look, what are you going to do with Peter? Huh? I'll never leave you. I'm going to be with you, Lord. I don't care what they do. I don't care what they say. I'm hanging with you. Peter. Before the cock crows three times, you will deny me. Or rather, before the cock crows no more, you will deny me three times. Man, Peter was always boasting and a bragging and carrying on. And then he said something else to Jesus. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Man, if I looked at y'all and told y'all, y'all full of the devil, just get out of my way. Y'all be ready to leave and take ten people with you. I'm tired of all this pre-qualification nonsense. Let me tell you something. You got to let God do a work in you. I remember teaching as an adjunct professor, let me put it that way, in a Bible college. And I learned something at that Bible college, and you know what? As quick as I learned, it seemed like I forgot it. And in recent times, God brought it back to me. But at this Bible college, the leader of the Bible school at the Bible college all these students are in there. I'm teaching, I don't know, might have had 60, 70 students. They came from all over the country. They weren't just from the southeast region. They came from California. They came from northeast. They came from Texas. They were from everywhere. And the first thing they did with them is they found out what were their talents. What gifts do they have? In other words, what can you bring to the table? They didn't test them. They didn't 
prove, it, it, listen, I know what the Bible says about deacons and proving them and let these first be proved and all that. But I didn't see the proving process Jesus put these disciples through. Other than going around with him Amen. as he went into their cities and into their villages, teaching and preaching and healing. Now they must have learned something because when Jesus appeared to feed all those thousands of folks, he told them, get these people organized. Amen. And they put them in 50s and 100s and whatnot. They had to section them out when Jesus blessed and broke the fish and the bread to feed them with. But what I'm saying is this. You need to get involved. And in these days and in these times, you don't have time necessarily to go to college. Most of you can't go there and get your theological degree and this and that and the other. I'm not down on that. I'm not against that. Not at all. But there's a lot of you that can bring more to the table than you're bringing. Amen. And for whatever reason, you're balking at it. I don't know why about that either. Maybe you talk to somebody. Oh, I've been through a lot in the years that I've served in the kingdom as a pastor. I had people that were interfering and influencing other members in a very negative way. And that's dangerous business. It's something I never did when I was a parishioner in other local churches. My wife and I were part of two local churches before God led us here to start Body of Christ. That was a long time ago. And I want you to know that our transition from one church to the other <clears throat> We didn't take anybody. We didn't influence anybody. We never spoke down to anybody about anybody or anything that was going on in that church. We didn't criticize the pastor. We didn't criticize the deacons. We didn't criticize the members. We didn't criticize anybody. We did all we could do because we were a very young family. We were young ourselves. Marjorie and I, were probably, we were in our 20s. And April was a little, little girl, little, little girl, okay? You know, you grab her by the hand across the street. She's that little. You put her in a car seat in the car, that little. Okay, and so during that time, uh, you know, we, we just didn't do that kind of thing. We learned early. And I'm quite sure in hindsight, God was leading us in dealing with us. And that's the reason why when God established the Body of Christ Church International USA, I've taught you through the years. Don't you do that stuff either. Amen. Well, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side, Pastor. Yeah, it might be. It still has to be mowed. Amen. You got to weed it, get the rocks out of there. You might have to, listen, let me tell you something. I don't care whose church it is. There's some fire ants in there somewhere. You ever seen them fire ant mounds? You say, man, how in the world these jokers penetrate, penetrate through here? Well, it takes some treatment. And the thing is, if you're going to treat them, you have to be careful because, man, the stuff you treat fire ants with can kill everything around them. And that's why a lot of people, that's why the scripture says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourselves, lest you be tempted. The body of Christ family, like I said, as far as I know, all my brothers and sisters had chores and had things to do in the Ripley household. And this is the body of Christ Church International USA. This is a household of faith. Amen. This is a household of faith. And every member and every part of it, whether you're here in person or whether you're there looking on the live stream, you're part of this family, you call this church home, you're involved in this as well. And we need the full measure of support. We need your physical support as often and as much as is possible. We definitely need your prayerful support as much and as fully as possible. And we need your financial support as fully and as much as possible. Amen. Everybody, put your hands together and give Jesus a great big break. What we don't need is excuses. Amen. My saying is, if you find an excuse, do not pick it up. There's a lot of rhymes and reasons out there, but you know what? Here's the thing. There's priorities in a family. 
I think I talked about this a little bit, maybe the last segment, it bears repeating a little bit. We're living in an age now, well, it's probably been around for longer than we know, in the blended family age, where two individuals, a, a husband and a wife, or a man and a woman, maybe they left the previous relationship. In some cases, they didn't even have a previous relationship. Amen. They just had a girlfriend or a boyfriend. They were shacking someplace. Yeah, remember that word, shack? Okay. <laughs> Common law, cohabitating with someone that was not either their husband or their wife. And then and even sometimes in the midst of that, children were brought into the mix. But then they discovered, I don't like you. You're dangerous. I got to leave this situation. Oh, okay. So you leave it. And then what? You go find, because you want some companionship, so you go find somebody else. But this time around, you might have got exposed to some teaching like this. And you say, well, you know what? <clears throat> I need to make this thing official. I need to do this right in the sight of God and in the fear of the Lord. I need to marry and commit my life to one person. Amen. And that person needs to be the opposite gender of what I am. Amen. But it may be. Because here you are two different individuals coming from two different situations. And maybe she's bringing two kids. And you got one or two. And we're coming in together. Priorities are critical, and it's no different than the church family. I, I already taught you about that in the context of the, the physical human family. Let me, let me talk about that in the church family context, all right? You have to have priorities, and your church family is a priority. Amen. Now, I understand the, the ultimate priority, God number one, Amen. your spouse next, your children after that. But then what's next? I'll tell you what's next, your church family. Amen. That's what's next. Because you've got this relationship going on Amen. with God. Amen. And this is the means and the way that he connects us all together. And he works through us to accomplish things that he wants to accomplish so that he can touch the world and let people know indeed how good, how merciful, and how great he truly is. Amen. And he wants to use each and every one of you. But if you're not available, if you're not here, you keep making excuses. I got this to do. I got that to do. I have said this before, and I'm going to bring it up again. When you defer your own personal agenda in favor of God, God will see to it. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how to say this. I see God in so many details in my life. Leading and guiding by his spirit is something we ought to be living with Amen. every day. Not something, I wonder if he's leading me. I wonder if he's there. No, he's there. Amen. When the psalmist said, give us, Lord, this day our daily bread, God gives daily bread. Amen. I assure you, every day you'll find God giving you bread. Maybe it's a 30-minute program. Maybe it's a say, I don't know what it is, but God always dispenses something to you. Amen. But we need to translate that into here. This is what builds strong church. This is what brings, uh, builds strong mission. This is what develops a church that impacts a community. Amen. Now, let me tell you something. When I went on a mission trip, I realized I couldn't save everybody there. You know what I'm saying in that context. I, I couldn't help everybody. But I could help who I could help. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And that's just me. But I'm just saying, when we get collective like this, we help a whole lot of people. Amen. And, and the thing is, you don't realize this. When you're in proper relationship and fellowship with your church family, uh, remember the Bible says, they that water others shall themselves be watered. There's no way in the world you're going to give out and not get back. Amen. That's not going to happen in the kingdom of God. No, no way. Jesus said, give, and it shall be given unto you. And then he said, if you sow sparingly. He said, what you get back solely depends on you. Because he says, if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. Amen. That's the principle of the kingdom. It's universal. If you sow bountifully, you will receive bountifully. You know, it's an interesting thing. I had a few minutes to look at 
Warren Buffett yesterday, he gave his annual report on Berkshire Hathaway. Now this man, here's a man in 11 figures. I want you to get your brain around that. He's worth 11 figures. We're talking tens of billions. And it's very interesting because, you know, I couldn't watch this whole little thing, but, but I learned in just a few minutes, it looked like I tuned in right at the right moment to find out that he and I agreed on a, a few things. Like I said, I ain't had time to watch all that stuff. But you know what I learned out of the time I did spend watching it? Because I couldn't watch the whole thing. It was an all-day deal. You cannot get away from the principles of the kingdom. Amen. He couldn't. I couldn't. You can't. Anything that he's built and brought up is based on the principle of the kingdom without a doubt. Amen. One thing that really stuck with me, he had a partner. His partner passed away back in November at the age of 99. Mr. Buffett himself is 93. And he said that that partner that he had, it was incredible the way that he described him. He said God had been with him all the way through thick and thin. He was the kind of fella. Warren said that even when he knew I was wrong and he was right, he would let me go ahead and make my blunder and would never, ever bring it up again. Now, you know, I, I, I can't even get my head around that. How, that was a very interesting thing, how he described that relationship and to see where they came from and where they got to because they weren't always wealthy. And I'm just saying to you, you, you belong to God. When you take those kinds of principles, when, you, when you, you take that kind of attitude, that kind of approach, that kind of commitment, that kind of in-depth involvement, identification, investment, you will experience the increase of the kingdom. Amen. That's exactly how it works. Amen. Can you say amen so amen. Praise God. So I want you, listen, I don't want you to just be thinking about it. I want you to be going on about it. What I learned in that Bible college, I hadn't forgot where I left off now, look. What I learned in that Bible college is a lot of those kids that were in there, they didn't do anything in their local churches. A few did. Most of them didn't do anything. And there wasn't any test that went on to figure out where they go. In other words, the experience going through the Bible college curriculum and, and the whole experience was, was the thing that was going to prove them out. One thing I do know, because I, I I've been their commencement speaker, on a few occasions as well, as I said, an adjunct professor coming in to teach on different topics. One thing I did learn, especially in the commencement, I, I saw kids I remembered teaching. And it was amazing the change that came over them from the first time I met them to graduation. I looked at them, they were dressing different, they were neat, they cleaned themselves up because when they came in, like I said, they were raw and rough. But apparently through their experience through the school, they gained some insight. Amen. And then I noticed that they were entrusted and appointed to different things within the church because there's a church attached to the Bible college. Right. Yeah. So they had a real living laboratory, a place where they could exercise those gifts and abilities and talents. Musical, some of them, you know, praise the Lord, they were able to get up and speak, do preliminary things like come up, open up the service, lead the worship and praise, close out the service, or do intermittent things in the course of a service. Assist in other things like dedications and all that, that type of thing. Amen. And so that's what I'm encouraging you to do. Thank you. I'm encouraging, well, Pastor, you don't know. See, I, I got some issues. Yeah, who, tell me who doesn't. Amen. I got some problems, Pastor. Yeah, Are you exclusive with that? You're the only one. Well, pastor, things ain't quite right in my household. Uh-huh. Show me the perfect one. Show me the one that's got it all together. Show me the one that uh, never disagrees, never finds conflict. I guarantee you, and I'm, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody in here, but I guarantee you, I've known a lot of y'all for a long time. And maybe you don't think I know it, 
But I guarantee you that through the times, especially those of you, whether I married you or whether you came already married, I know you all been through some changes. I know you've been through some difficulties. I know you've been through some challenges. I'm your pastor and I know I've been through them too. Amen. You know why? Because I'm like you. I put these pair of pants on one leg at a time this morning. I put my feet in my shoes one at a time this morning. I had to shower this morning, brush my teeth. I had to shave this morning. I had to put a little sweet smell on. I don't use Brill cream anymore. Marginita and I have fussed at each other, sometimes over 15 cents worth of nothing. And a lot of that probably could have been avoided if I hadn't been so prideful. Well, now, don't shout me down here. And some of it could have been avoided, ladies, if you had decided to cut your word count a little bit. I know you've been nagging that joker for years. And he still didn't do what you were going after him about. Now that might change after this message today. I don't know. I just want you to know nothing is hidden from the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now either Jesus loves us all unconditionally Either he has a purpose for us all. Either he has, listen, either when we, when we received him as Savior and Lord, when we confessed him in our lives and we accepted him and believed that God raised him from the dead, we became saved. We were regenerated. We were redeemed. Now, either we're that or we're not. And I want you to know that from the moment that happened, we not only literally pass from spiritual death to e eternal life, but we, came, we became the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus as we were. And hold on a minute. And we still are. With all the disagreements, with all the misunderstandings, with all the nagging, with all the issues, with all the difficulties, with all the explosions, with the broken windows, the kicked in doors. Don't shout me down, I'm still in the house. If Jesus is your Savior and Jesus is your Lord, you're still the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You know, it's an interesting thing. You believe more that you're human than you do that you're a child of God. Amen. And, and as far as I can see, just about all y'all are, both. Amen. You see, it's an interesting thing. But in the legal system, when they bust somebody that was a pedophile or whatever they were. You, you know, because you had some sensational cases like that doctor they busted up in Illinois or Michigan somewhere. And he was supposed to be treating those girls in the gymnastics team. And they found out that he was molesting them, right? Uh, that dude is still a doctor. Now, you, it's a sad state of affairs. I'm not justifying what he did. I'm just simply saying that he still carries the knowledge, the techniques, and the methodologies. And though you may not ever think you'll ever hear from him again, which could be very well true, because I think they slapped him with more years and Carter's got little pills, right? Uh, but, but somewhere along the line, if they need 
medical assistance, they're going to tap it. Amen. They will do that. Amen. Because somehow or another, those talents and abilities and gifts can't go to waste. That's right. Those things are God-given. God-given. Amen. Amen. It's like people say, I can't, I can't deal with the youth, I'm too old. No, what, doctors get old too. Amen. They keep practicing. Amen. I know a bunch of pediatricians. When they started, with, well, one of them specifically that worked with my kids, uh, we were all young back then. <laughs> and, and now, all of our kids are grown. Amen. And he's still out there practicing pediatrics. God bless him. Might have a little gray hair, and he might be missing a little hair now, but I'm just saying he's still practicing his craft, Amen. his skills. Stop making excuses. Let's get into this thing. Let's get involved. I wouldn't care if all of you men were ushers. I wouldn't care if all of you women were greeters or whatever roles we have for you to operate in. We can add some more to the music, worship, and arts department. We're, and the good news I got for you, we're not going to always be in this place. Amen. 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 And the good, and listen, the good news I got to give you today is, listen, any day now, I'm going to give you a move out Thank day. Thank any day. I know y'all ready to go. I'm ready to go. I've heard that y'all are ready to go. I know. And we're going to go. But we're going to go together. In the name of Jesus. And we're purposing to be more effective, more efficient than ever before, more excellent than ever before. But now I must un you must understand, in the process of getting involved here, there is training. Because see, at the Bible college, what did actually happen, even though those kids coming in were raw and rough, they, they, were, they were refined along the school year. They learned from teachers like myself. I would go in and teach them the ministry of helps, among other topics. And so I was the one designed to train them, how do you usher? How do you serve as a hostess? How do you engage in the music department? How do you do this? How do you help and assist the pastor? Amen. How do you fulfill whatever role it is that your gift is, is all about? Yeah. See, there's some people in churches, there's some people that have an incredible gift of being able to comfort the bereaved. Amen. We find out you're one of them, that's what you ought to be doing. Amen. Put you in there and bring comfort. And assurance. And see, you got a serving spirit on you. Because you're the kind of person that'll organize things in the house, Amen. make sure that the bereaved family doesn't have to lift a finger to do anything. You're pouring the pitcher of water and tea. You're serving the food. You're asking, is there anything else we can do before we say goodnight or whatever? Amen. That's who you are. Amen. And that's what you do. And you get more joy out of that than anything else. Amen. And let me tell you something. The Bible says that a faithful man shall abound with blessing. So if you're faithful in that gift, faithful in whatever that is, I know I'm going over time, so who cares? Listen, if you're faithful in that, God says you will abound in blessing. Listen here. I said I'm like you. I don't always feel like coming in here preaching. I don't always feel like being nice. Naturally, in the natural, I think I'm a pretty nice guy. I haven't had, many people say I wasn't. I can't say I've never had any. But I lived a long time now, and I'm just saying, you know, but I don't even remember those instances, but I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Sometimes people get on your last nerve. And you want to tell them. And I just want to tell you that God has given me 50 ways. It's like Paul Simon wrote that song, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. <laughs> Get on the bus, Gus. No need to be coy, Roy. Right. God's given me 50 ways to tell people no or leave me alone. Without crushing their spirit. That's right. Amen. And you'll gather that. You'll learn these things. It's, it's, it's okay. Amen. One thing about it, you, we need one another. E even when, listen, even when we have friction, 
that's how jagged stones become smooth stones. You put them in a little rock tumbler, they knock all the little edges off. And by, when you finish tumbling those rocks, you, you go in there and say, oh my goodness, they're, they're smooth as silk. Right. And we need each other's little frictions. We need each other's little whatever. Yeah, you're going to discover, man, I tried to call so-and-so, they, they hadn't returned my call, this, that. You, you may go through some things like that. That's okay. It's all a part of the process. One thing you all, as the Body of Christ Church International USA, have sustained since the beginning, since our tenure in East Point, Georgia. Amen. Something we call, affectionately, the lingering spirit. <laughs> Ask some of the members that were with us, like the tallies here, y'all was at Ware Avenue. You said, yeah, oh, that's right, yeah, but that's, then she finally got you, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, listen, Vanessa was in there, man, making intercession and supplications and everything for this man here. Amen. And she got him in there. Amen. Now, you know, you know, we know God is the one who did it, but she wouldn't give up. And he got in and ended up becoming one of the most prolific yes. servants Amen. of God Amen. in the kingdom. I know about all y'all. There's something I can say, something nice and good about all y'all. I just, I wish I had the time. I'd just go one by one and tell y'all. Now, now, listen, I know y'all haven't heard good things about yourselves all the time. I know that. But, but I'm glad to be able to stand here and tell you, you know what? There's something I can say good about every one of you. And listen, if you adopt that policy, if you adopt that attitude, you'll probably find more positive experiences than negative ones. I'm sorry, I can't promise you no disappointments. I can't promise you no failures. I can't promise you no whatever. That, it, that's life. Jesus said it. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And that's all I'm challenging you to do. Overcome yourself and get involved. Make a difference. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God, praise God. This is a little different in the uh, live stream audience. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, like I said, live stream is really just a window into this church family and into this ministry, into our mission, into what God has specifically called us to do. And this is a very important thing. I know, you know, listen, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of churches here in America, and then you got hundreds and hundreds of thousands more outside of America, in Canada, South America, Latin America, the Middle East, Asia, all over the place. Amen. And we're all different. That's right. And we don't, listen, and we don't all have buildings Amen. or permanent facilities. Amen. I've been to Africa, I've been to these different places where they're just meeting, it looked like they got a shanty up here. And they, but do you know what? There's people come out to worship God. Amen. There's a pastor there to teach and preach to them and minister to them and heal them. And then eventually, you know, they begin to grow and develop and things like that. But that's the reality. Amen. We're here, we sort of put everything and standardize everything on the basis of who we are and what we're doing. And comparisons are real tricky things to get into. But I just want to say to you this. One thing you want in any arrangement is unconditional love. Amen. You want to know that you belong. You want to know that you're welcome. You want to know that you're loved, that you're appreciated. And you want to know that if an issue comes up, somebody will be there to support you and help you. And I think those are the most premier traits and characteristics of any church that there should be. And that's very, very important. Like I said, I, if I, I'd love to just take another hour and just do what I just said because all of you have left some kind of positive in not only my life, but my family's life. Some of you here blessed us while our children were growing up. 
when they were like her size and when they were like the baby size right there and just like the little guys back yonder there. When we started ministry, April was a young girl. Then Heather came along six months after the body of Christ started. And then Joey came in and cashed in on everything. <laughs> Boy, I had three mamas. And, and, and what do you call the, the pick of the litter, so to speak, right? So again, you know, we, we, we had to grow as a family. We'll share stories with you. We'll, we'll talk about it. My kids weren't always perfect. Uh, you know, they, they had agendas. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. We, 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 we raised, listen, we raised three infants, three toddlers, three teenagers to adulthood. Amen. And that was no small feat. And they had to go away from us when they went to college and spent four years away from us. Amen. Heather Moore, because she went to law school. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying, they spent all those years away from us. And, you know, we couldn't be with them all the time. We saw them very occasionally. Amen. Whenever they came home for the weekend or whatever or off on breaks and things like that. And they could have been exposed to the same stuff that you see going on out here right now. Thank God they weren't. But the thing was, their mother and I had the responsibility to do exactly what Proverbs 22, 6 said. Train them up in the way they should go. Amen. So when they grow old, they won't depart from that way. Now, I can't promise kids don't get wayward or drift somewhat. But if you hold on to that promise from God, if you applied that, I'm just saying in your upbringing, that doesn't mean you were perfect at it. But hold on to that promise. And even if your kids, maybe you came into the knowledge of God after your children got grown. Still don't give up. Luke 18, 1 is on your side. Men ought always to pray and not faint. Speak the word over your grown children. Ask God to send laborers to cross their path. They may not ever listen to you, but they'll listen to some, God's got somebody out there that can unlock their lock. He's got the key to unlock them. You got to trust him. Live stream, y'all in a big deal here today. I, listen, I'm just thanking God. What I asked God before I stepped up on this platform, I said, Lord, less of me, more of you, none of me, all of you. And you do whatever you want to do in this service today. And there's, there's some, I don't know. I can only tell you this. I sense an anointing of boldness that has come upon me. And everybody's going to know it here in just a moment. But I'm just, but I'm just saying, yeah, there's a boldness on me. And I know I'm moving into time zone and all this kind of thing. But uh, listen, this is important. Very important. That's why we're all here. But first things first. You that are watching us through the live stream and even those of you that are here in person, because this is what we're all about. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you need to know him as your Lord and Savior, because that's the beginning, the middle, and the end of it all. All right? Amen. So I want to lead you in this special prayer right now. Whoever you are, wherever you are, take a moment right now. Come on with us as we go boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in time of need. And pray this prayer and say, Dear God, in heaven, I come to you realizing that in my life I have sinned and come short of your glory. I repent of all of my sin and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who died on the cross, and shed his blood to save me from all of my sin is the Lord of my life. And I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead, that I might be justified, just as if I had never sinned. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and live in me now. I believe that I receive eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior that I am now made a new creation in Christ Jesus, born again of the Spirit of God in Jesus' name. 
amen. Praise God forever.